The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Transcribed and presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Did you ever stop to think how a little thing like a penny postcard can change your whole life? Take this case, for example. Tonight, thousands of people are listening for this Equitable Society radio program's middle commercial, all because some Equitable Society representative took the trouble to mail out postcards, postcards inviting them to do so. This commercial will bring you a special message about the Equitable Society's independent 60s plan a practical, workable plan for people who want to be completely independent in their 60s. I'll be back in approximately 14 minutes to give you full information on this special plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Runaway Guest. The first important study of the criminal as a human being and of the factors which go to make him a criminal was undertaken some 75 years ago in New York. The result was a report which gave to the English language the word jukes, out of which has come such words as juke joint and several others. That study made the point for the first time that heredity and environment were important factors in the formation of the criminal. Other studies have been made from time to time on the same subject. Sociologists are still trying to determine the factors that turn a person into an enemy of society. Those factors are, of course, many and varied, and scientists are no closer to a definite solution to the problem than they are to finding all the reasons for people falling in love. However, one factor does keep appearing in case history after case history. One factor that seems to be the dominant reason for a man becoming a criminal. That factor is greed. Like hate, greed is a consuming evil. And ultimately, it must destroy the person it possesses. For it drives him to constantly increasing wants. Wants which can only be satisfied by cheating, by stealing, by killing. Tonight's file opens on the great American desert. It is nighttime, and two rather elderly men on equally ancient burrows are slowly riding along a dusty trail. Ike, look at those stars. Yeah. Look close enough to touch. Uh-huh. Glad all those folks from the city can't see a night like this. They'd all come here. Boy, the whole thing. Yeah. You know what a fella at the water hole told me about that silver train goes by here every night? What? Says it goes 100 miles an hour. Not very likely. That's what I said. Sure don't go that fast coming up the grade. No. Let's get across the tracks before it comes. No reason to, Floyd. Let's wait. Wonder where it's going. Dangerous to start thinking that way. Why? Next thing you know, you'll be wanting to get on it to find out. Another one of them silver ones. Uh -huh. Look at the folks in there, all crowded together. Wouldn't like that. Well, I guess it's all right if you don't know no better. Say, Floyd, you see that? What? Something fell off. Off the train? Yeah. Where? 
back there. You sure? Uh huh. Let's go see what it is. Get him. Come on, come on. Get him. What did it look like? Couldn't rightly tell. Too dark. Come on, Jim. I see something up there. Yeah. Looks like it's a man. Uh-huh. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Uh. He dead, Floyd? Don't think so. He hurt bad? Only thing I can tell is he's bleeding bad. Grab his feet, Ike. Put him on my burrow. We'll take him back to the cabin and fix him up. Early the next morning, at a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor meets Agent Dave Gibson in the hall. Hello, Dave. Oh, hi, Jim. You just signing in? Uh-huh. Been over to police headquarters on that Thompson case. Oh, they thought they had a lead, but it didn't work out. Well, we're on one now that's tougher than the Thompson case. Another escape prisoner? That's right. What's the dope on this one? You ever come across a file on a Leo Newton? I don't think so. He shot a policeman out on the coast. Well, how do we get in on it? Well, a couple of weeks ago, he was picked up back east as a suspect in a robbery case. His gun was sent to our lab by the local police. The unidentified ammunition file revealed that Newton's gun was the one that was used to kill the policeman. I see. Extradition was requested and granted, and Newton was being transferred to the coast for trial on the murder charge. In our custody? No, a local sheriff. Well, while the train was going through the desert last night, Newton asked the sheriff to take off the handcuffs while he undressed to go to bed. Mm-hmm. Now, well, the sheriff did. Newton slugged him and jumped off. Anybody see him? Not that I can find out. When do we get the report? This morning when the sheriff came to. Oh, he reported that when Newton slugged him, he fell against the compartment and uh, broke his wristwatch. Newton must have really lowered the bow on him. Yeah, I guess he did. Watch stopped at 8.46. I checked with the railroad to find out exactly where the train was at that time. It had passed a little town on the desert named Aurora at 8.16. 30 minutes before the slugging. That's right. The engineer said that he was doing 20 miles an hour on that upgrade, so that would put the train about 10 miles out of Aurora. West of there? Yeah. Dave, I'm going out there now and see if I can find Newton. If I get any kind of a lead, I'll be in touch with you. Lloyd. Yeah? He just moved. No. It looks like he's coming, too. About time. Uh, hello, young fella. Where am I? In our shack. Ah. Oh, now, do get up. Who are you? Ike Mason. This is Floyd Edwards. How'd I get here? We picked you up after you fell off in the train. Oh. What's your name? Uh... Uh, Leo. Leo Newton. You remember falling off in the train? Uh-huh. How did it happen? Well, it was hot. I... I wanted some air. I walked out to the platform. I guess I, uh, got dizzy. All I remember is I started to fall. I couldn't stop myself. You're lucky I seen you. You might have laid there for a month. How, uh, far is it to town? Depends what town you mean. Anyone. Aurora is the closest. About 18 miles. You're pretty far from anything out here. We like it that way. How do you live? We do a little prospecting. For gold? Uh-huh. Find anything? Enough to get our food, water. They got a mine? Uh, no, we ain't. Uh, but I... uh, we just uh, pan for the stuff. Been lucky, huh? Uh, look, mister, asking questions can make you real tired. You'd better get some rest. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Jim. Dave Gibson. Oh, hi, Dave. I tried to get you before. I know. I got your message. Find anything? No, not too much. Have you been to where Newton jumped off the train? Yeah, and he must have hurt himself. The sand was soft there, but I found a pretty big blood stain. Uh Uh-huh. I also found some burrow tracks leading away from where Newton fell. You think that was a rendezvous point with some Confederates? Oh, I doubt that. This section of the desert has quite a few prospectors in it. Now, my guess is a couple of them found him and took him back to the cabin. 
Maybe you could have the local radio station broadcast an alarm. I've done that, Dave, but according to the police down here, not many of the prospectors have radios or telephones, so I doubt that'll be much help. Oh. I'm afraid I'm going to have to spread this alarm by word of mouth. I assume you couldn't follow those borrow tracks. Well, not very far. They led to a salt bed, and I couldn't pick them up on the other side. Jim, you think a plane might help? Oh, I doubt it. After all, it's 17 hours since he jumped. That's true. Dave, your desk clean. It can be in a little while. Well, how about grabbing a train and getting down here? I'll leave within an hour, Jim. Good. I'd like to find Newton as soon as we can. Until we do, whoever picked him up is in real danger. Hmm? What are you doing here? I was feeling better. I took a walk. Saw you come in here. Never know from the outside this was a mine. <laughs> Where's your partner? Went to the springs to get water. Why'd he say he didn't have a mine? Why'd he tell me that? You'll have to ask him, mister. How you doing here? No good. No gold at all? Just enough to buy grub. <laughs> you fellas must be awfully hungry. Huh? You want all this work for just grub. Mr. Newton, you're feeling lots better, ain't you? Some. If you've got strength enough to walk from the cabin to here, you've got enough to ride into town. I think tomorrow morning, you ought to get set to be on your way. <laughs> Ike. It's fixing to blow pretty hard. Where's Mr. Newton? Back inside the cabin, sleeping. Why? I ran into Pete Roberts at the spring. Uh, Pete told me the police are looking for a fellow who escaped. Describe the fellow. It's him. You sure? Positive. Pete said the police said the fellow escaped by jumping off the train. He's a crook, then. Seems so. I knew it this afternoon. Uh, what do you mean? He followed me to the mine. Asked a lot of questions. Does he know we've got gold? No. I told him we was taking him into town tomorrow. When we get to Aurora, you excuse yourself and go call the law. Now you won't. Huh? You're not calling the law. How long you been spying on us? Long enough. Better put that rifle down, Mr. Newton. I need it to get information. What do you mean? About where you keep your gold. We ain't got none. You didn't have a mine either. Now look, I know you got a stash someplace. Now get it up or this rifle goes off twice. We will return in just a minute to tonight's exciting FBI file. Tonight, on the 1st of July, with Independence Day only two days away, seems a specially appropriate time to invite you to take advantage of the Equitable Society's famous Independent 60s plan. The Equitable Society created this plan for self-reliant Americans who want to keep on being independent after they're 60 years old for men and women who want to be self-respecting and self-supporting, able to do what they choose and live where they choose. My wife and I bought a nice little seven-acre farm. We keep our own cows, chickens, and have a big garden. That's one way to beat the high cost of living. I can well believe it. We have a deep freeze so we can have our own fruits and vegetables all winter long. Every time I talk to a man who's retired on an equitable society independent 60s plan, there's just one thought that comes to my head. Why doesn't everybody have a plan like this? Many people make the same mistake I made for years. They think you have to be rich to afford a plan like this. What opened your eyes? My Equitable Society representative. He showed me that I was already halfway towards independent 60, thanks to Social Security and the life insurance I already own. That's a fact. In many cases, only a small amount of additional insurance is required to enable a man to look forward with complete confidence 
to independent 60s. A few extra dollars a week did it for me. So why not see your equitable representative without delay? Phone him soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Runaway Guest. The criminal, despite what you may have heard or read elsewhere, is not a breed apart. He is, except for a notable flaw in character, exactly like any one of you now listening to this program. In tonight's case from the files of your FBI, for instance, you meet a known killer, a man who has taken another human being's life without a second's worth of remorse. That killer does not talk out of the side of his mouth. He is distinctly not the average murderer you meet in fiction stories. He is articulate, he buys his clothes in the same stores you do, and he might even have gone to the same school as you. He is, in fewer words, not one who can be recognized from his speech, his face, or his clothes, any more than any other criminal can be recognized from those things. The only thing that distinguishes the criminal from the law-abiding citizen is his engaging in crime. The fact that crime of almost every kind is increasing to the point of establishing new high water marks each year indicates to many serious students that the national character is undergoing a change for the worse. That each year the moral fiber of our people becomes slightly weaker, slightly less capable of withstanding the temptation to commit some illegal act. Whether that is true or not is something the Federal Bureau of Investigation has no way of knowing. But what is true beyond any question is that crime in this nation is at an all-time peak, and that means virtually every crime, from arson to murder. Tonight's file continues at police headquarters in Aurora. Agent Gibson has just arrived to join Special Agent Jim Taylor. Anything come in on Newton, Jim? No, not a thing. Quite a storm blowing up. Yeah, yeah, I know, Dave. I was hoping you'd get Newton before I got here. Well, so was I, but he hasn't come into town since he jumped the train. I see. I've posted pictures of him around town, and the editor of the local weekly is going to run his picture. Most of the people around here get the paper. When does that come out? Well, that's a trouble, Dave. Not for three days. I spent some time studying Newton's record while I was at the office, Jim. Oh? With a gun in his hands, he's a potential killer every minute. He gives no warning when he's going to start shooting. He just levels the gun and lets go. That's why we've got to get him as soon as we possibly can. Are there any leads at all? Well, not much. No, oh, one of the burrows has a cleft on the right front hoof. I'm going to check on that now. Where? Over at the assayer's office. If I'm right about the owners of those burrows being prospectors, maybe the assayer can help us find out which ones they were. All right, pull that floorboard up all the way. Hey, listen to that wind. Maybe it'll blow the joint over and save us a lot of hard work. Now, let me have a look. There's nothing under it. I'll see for myself. Well, we'll just rip up someplace else. Look, mister, I'm tired. We'll tear this whole shack down if we have to. I'm going to find that gold. Now, let's, uh, let's try underneath the bed. Slide the bed out of the way. It ain't there. Move the bed. Very well. Start with the bottom board in the corner. You hear me? We ain't ripping anymore. Get to work. No. Maybe I'm getting too close, huh? We done enough. Okay, I'll work on this patch myself. You two guys get back over there. Go on. Don't try to jump me. I'll have the rifle within reach. Wait. No. Stay back. Well, look what I found. Leave that gold alone. Easy, Pop. Floyd! Now, you stay put or you'll get the same treatment. But I... You go get the burrows. I'm taking this gold and heading for town, and you're coming with me to show me the way. I can't leave Floyd. Yes, you can. But the storm... We'll take a chance on that. 
Go get the burrows ready. As soon as dawn breaks, we're getting out of here. Dave, maybe we can get someplace with this map. What do you got? All the assayers of us got up this list of the ball of prospectors for us. Here, take a look. Yeah, not as many as I thought there'd be. No, that's one break we got, but... Here, wait till you get a look at where their cabins are. Is that what those marks on the map are? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But the only line running through that territory is this black line representing railroad tracks, Jim. There are no roads. I know that, so let's split the list in half. I'll take everything this side of the tracks. But how do we travel? That's already been taken care of. I, I went by the ranger station to make arrangements to use their jeeps, and they had some walkie-talkies. We've got a pair of them. They'll also give us any other cooperation they can. Fine. Then we can check with each other, say, oh, every half hour. And as soon as either one of us finds anything, we'll get together. Jim. Yeah, Dave, where are you? I'm at a ranger substation. It's located at G7 on the map. G7. Yeah, I see it. I didn't get a thing over in this half. You find anything? Yeah. I located the prints of that burrow, the one with the cleft hoof. Where? You got your map? Yeah. I look right about H8. You see where the railroad tracks curve? Yeah, I found it. Were you able to follow them? No, the storm has pretty well covered up most of the prints. Oh, I also found a bloodstained shirt, partly buried. Newton's initials were monogrammed on the left sleeve. Uh, oh, pardon me, Jim. The phone over here is ringing. Oh. Special Agent Gibson... Uh-huh. You have? Where? Who told you? Uh-huh. When? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So long. Jim, that was the ranger station in Aurora. They took a chance and called here. What'd they want? A man named Pete Roberts just called the police and told them that Leo Newton is at a cabin belonging to two old prospectors named Edwards and Mason. Where's the cabin? At G-9. On the map, right near Navajo Pass. Wait a minute. G-9, Navajo Pass. Got it. Let's meet at the cabin as quick as we can. Jim? No, no, I just got here myself. All right, cover me, Dave. Okay. I'm moving in. There's nobody here. Empty, huh? Hey, Dave, look. Over there in the corner. One of the prospects. Yeah. He's still alive. Uh, Dave, get that water bucket over there, will you? I'll see what we can do for him. Okay, Jim. His head's bleeding. You must have been slugged. Yeah. Uh, here you are. Here's a rag. Oh, thanks. It's a pretty nasty cut. Yeah, isn't it? It looks like somebody was trying to tear up the floor of this place. Yeah. Dave, what are these old fellas prospect for? Gold. Oh. Well, Newton was probably trying to find it. I suppose he's headed for town. Yeah. yeah some town. You better notify all surrounding areas to be on the lookout for him. He must have commandeered the other old prospector to act as a guide. He did. What? I just found this note in the old man's hand. What's it say? Just, uh, dear Floyd, I'll be back. I guess the other old fellow wrote it, huh? Yeah. Come on, let's get off my jeep. <laughs> Maybe a day, maybe a week. Take the 
good time to get out of here. <laughs> Any water left? No. Hey. What? It's cabin up ahead. I see it. You come to the edge of town? That's a cabin, ain't it? Wait a minute, I've... That's your cabin. Huh? That's your cabin. Well, what do you know? You've been taking me around in circles. I guess maybe I have. It's quite a joke, and I got one that tops it, and this one's going to be on you. Put down that rifle. You're getting it, Pop. <laughs> ah, you all right, Mr. Mason? Oh, thanks to you, I am. Good shooting, mister. I just knocked the gun out of his hands. All right, come on, Newton. You're not hurt. Who are you? The special agents of the FBI. They're arresting you for attempted murder. Leo Newton was turned over to local authorities on the charge of killing a police officer. He was found guilty and sentenced to be executed. Special Agents Taylor and Gibson waited at the cabin instead of attempting to pursue the fugitive because of the note found in the unconscious prospector's hand. The note which said, I'll be back. Agent Taylor's reasoning was that it would have been obvious to Floyd Edwards that Ike would return, and therefore, the note must have had some other and greater reason for being left. It could mean he was returning with Leo Newton. Taylor's decision to wait outside the cabin for Ike to lead his man back to where they had started ended with results which you have already witnessed. And so two special agents were able to apprehend a dangerous killer before he added another victim to his list. In this case, the allies of your FBI with the courage and ingenuity of a citizen. And those two are deadly weapons which, if given enough use by every citizen, when he finds himself in a position to employ them, will ultimately lead to the conquering of the crime wave, to the defeat of the American criminal. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, two final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Mr. Keating, did you say Social Security and my present life insurance will help get one of these plans? Very definitely. In many cases, the two combined take care of the major cost of the plan. Well, about how much do you think I'd get each month when I'm 60? Well, that depends, of course, on your present earnings and your future needs. You and your equitable representative can work it out together. Give him a ring any time. He'll be glad to drop over for a friendly visit. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual history of two international criminals. Its subject, homicide. Its title, The Transatlantic Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's program was transcribed, and the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Harry Bartell, Herb Butterfield, Frank Lovejoy, and Paul McVeigh. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the transatlantic shakedown on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.